So this morning, what I want to talk to you guys about um, is this idea of being an ambassador, an ambassador for Christ. That's going to be the thing that we talk about. And, um, you know, ambassador is not really a word that we use a lot in our language. It's not really a word that we hear a lot. Um, and so I want to just kind of sort of connect us a little bit to what that idea is. And so I need your participation a little bit. I need your help. Okay, so I'm going to um, basically give you guys some names, and then I want you to just kind of shout out what is the first thing that, you, that comes to mind. All right, the first one is Elon Musk. Brilliant. There we go. Smart. How about Tesla <laughs> or SpaceX, right? All right, how about Bill Gates? Microsoft, there we go, very good. How about LeBron James? Good, good. How about the song Beat It or Thriller? There you go. And sadly, it's closed today, but what about the Lord's Chicken? Chick-fil-A, that's right, the Gospel Bird. Yes. How many times have you guys gone like out Sunday after church and been like, oh, I'm going to go to Chick-fil-A? Oh, man, <laughs> so sad, so sad. So see, so here's what's interesting about that. We don't talk a lot about this word ambassador, but it's just something that we understand a lot more than probably you think, because each of those people, they stand for something. And what they have done well is they've represented their cause really well. You don't have to take a lot of time, as I name those people or those entities, to understand who they are, what they represent, um, what they're all about. We can quickly name those guys off. And so that's what I want us to start to think about as we um, begin to hear from the Word of God. God has called us to be ambassadors. He has called us to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ. And the question that I want you to start to just kind of ask yourself, and if you're taking notes, you can write these down. Are we representing Jesus well? Are we representing Jesus well? Um, is the way that we're living our life pointing others to Jesus? Is the way that we're living our life pointing others to Jesus? What is our life saying about Jesus? Because as followers of Christ, God has called us to be representatives of him. God has called us to be ambassadors. I just want to go through a few verses here just to start us out, just to kind of help build a foundation for us. And this is um, just answering the question, what does the Bible say about this idea of being an ambassador of Jesus Christ? Let's look at a very familiar passage, Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 through 16. You are the light of the world, a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone. Keep peace there in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. Why? So that they may see, so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven, right? Let's look at John chapter 13, verse 34 through 35. It says this, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must also love one another. And this is the challenging, convicting part. By this, by our love, by how we care for each other, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Here's another one, 1 Peter 2.9. It says this, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare in our lives, in the way that we live, in our words, and our actions, that we may declare the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. Amen? And then finally, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. We are therefore what? Christ's ambassadors, Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So we have been charged as Christ's followers. We have been charged by the Lord to represent him well, 
in, in our everyday lives. And, and we are called to be ambassadors of Christ. We are called to be ambassadors of Christ. If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn to Daniel chapter 6. Today, we're going to land in Daniel, and we're going to look at the life of Daniel. And there's three things that I want to bring out from the life of Daniel that I believe will help us be better ambassadors of Christ. These three things will help us grow in our calling in this charge to represent Jesus well. Um, the first thing that, we, uh, that I want us to see is this idea of reputation, this idea of reputation. So if you're taking notes, that's the first thing, this idea of reputation. Now, to kind of help us understand that, I just thought I would share a little bit about me. Um, and I have this reputation in my household. And among my family members, I have been told, could you believe this, that I am an aggressive driver. What? That is so unfair. So unfair. I mean, I am a peaceful being. I am so peaceful. Um, but my kids, you know, my kids will, will, come, will come back and mom will come home from work and they'll be like, daddy, daddy drove speed today. And I'm like, you can't, stop, don't do that. You're, you're selling me out to mom when she gets home. Uh, the other day we were, you know, we live right off of like Clark and kind of Honoré. So, you know, that whole intersection has just been like destroyed. And I think they've missed like multiple deadlines to try to get that thing right. And so we're, we're coming down Clark, uh, good, trying to get up on 75. And, you know, you guys have probably done it. You're trying to navigate which lane do I need to be in, all these things. And so, you know, I'm, I'm getting on or whatever. And I kind of speed up through, through the cars and my wife goes, you're such an aggressive driver. And I'm like, I, I am not an aggressive driver. And I choose to, to name it, I'm a proactive driver. I'm a proactive driver. And I, I am keeping you guys safer. Okay, I am keeping you guys safer. <laughs> so I will admit, I have a low tolerance for dumb when it comes to the road, okay? <laughs> So in my household, <laughs> who's with me, right? You're with me, right? It's proactive. It's proactive. Listen, I'm just making a decision faster than everyone else does, okay? I, I can't help that. I can't help that. So we understand a reputation, right? Do you guys remember like when you got your yearbook at the end of the year and people's pictures were in there like most, uh, you know, most congenial, most likely to become a lawyer or, you know, we, we gave all these labels to people in our classes. Um, and why did we do that? Because they had this reputation. They had this reputation. And um, man, I think of, of men in my life. I think of my dad and the reputation that he has left and uh, that he um, continues to live out. Uh, he's a hero of mine. He was a pastor and um, gave his life to ministry. I think of, you know, you won't know these names, but a guy named Herb Marlowe, who came and, and, and stood alongside me as a young married man, as a, as a young pastor, and met with me on a week-to-week -week basis and just said, man, this is this is what I've learned. This is, this is, these are the things that I've learned in, in marriage and in ministry and, 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 and how to just navigate the workforce. And man, I'm so thankful for men who, who, would, who would do that, those kinds of things. And they've left a reputation. They've left a reputation. So let's, let's look um, just a little bit ahead of uh, Daniel chapter 6. Just, just stay with me. We're going to kind of touch very quickly on Daniel chapter 5, verses 5 through 6. And one of the things that I want you to understand about Daniel is that he had a reputation. Now, Daniel was deported, okay, into the nation of, into really the empire at the time of Babylon, okay? And Daniel spent 70 years in Babylon. He went through multiple kings, okay? And in Babylon at this time, they were um, what we call a very polytheistic um, nation, which means they believed in many gods. They practiced a lot of idol worship. And so here is Daniel, a Hebrew, um, someone who is under a system of worshiping one God, Yahweh, and he has now been put um, against his will, really, at the beginning. He has been put into the nation of Babylon. And we see that 
at the time, there is this big party happening, and uh, there's a big feast happening, and all these people are having this big feast, okay? And uh, suddenly, something crazy happens, okay? Listen to this. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared, and they wrote on the plaster of the wall. Like, can you imagine that? Like, if we're here right now and some, something just starts, like a hand appears and starts writing on the wall over there, right? Like, that is wild, okay? The king watched the hand, the king at the time, watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale, obviously, and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. And so the king, he, he grabs, um, if you look at the scripture, it talks about these diviners and these wisdom people that the king had in his court. And so he ga- gathers all these guys around and it's like, Tell me, you guys are my wise counsel. Tell me what's happening. Tell me, you know, um, what, what does this mean? And nobody could understand what was happening. And because of a reputation, the queen at the time remembers this guy named Daniel, okay? And here's what she says in Daniel chapter 5, verse 11. She says to the king, There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods. Now, remember, they worshiped many gods, so she didn't fully understand who Daniel's God was yet, but Daniel had this reputation. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. That's a pretty sweet accolade, right? Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. So they bring Daniel in. They bring Daniel in, and Daniel ends up interpreting this um, writing on the wall. Ultimately, it, to the, the king, the current king was King Belshazzar, okay? And it actually ends up leading to his demise. It actually, Scripture says that he was actually defeated that night, okay? And then a new king enters into the picture, and that is Darius. And that's where we're going to really spend the rest of our time this morning. But Daniel had this reputation, right? All these other wise men, all these other people in the king's council couldn't figure out what this handwriting on the wall was. But the queen remembered this guy, this guy who was already having a legacy among the kingdom. And she remembers and she brings Daniel in and Daniel interprets the handwriting on the wall. So now there is a guy named King Darius who is in place. And Daniel's reputation just continues to increase if you look at the story. And at the time, Darius tries to bring together 120 men who he feels are wise, okay? And he's putting this team together, and he wants to have three leaders that are over this 120 uh, men. And one of the leaders that he chooses to be in charge of this 120, one of the three is Daniel, okay? Okay. Look at this, Daniel chapter 6, verse 3. Now Daniel was so, Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Wow. Here's a guy, remember, who is not part of their culture. He was not a Babylonian. And yet the king already desires to put him in a place of power, to put him in a place of leadership. Why? Because of what Daniel's reputation meant, right? Let's keep looking at it. Now, as we, as we unpack the story, uh, if you know the story a little bit, these other leaders start to get jealous of Daniel. They're like, why is this guy who's not a part of our culture, not a part of our, our world, how is he getting all this attention from the king? So they begin to get jealous. And what they're looking for is they want to find mistakes in Daniel's life. They want to catch Daniel in, um, in, in something that they can hold against him ultimately. But here's what we see in Daniel chapter 6, verse 4. It says this, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Amazing, right? Amazing. Let's keep keep going. Daniel 6, verse 5. So finally, these men said to each other, we will never 
That's an absolute statement, right? We will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God, okay? With the law of his God. So it's really important for us as we understand what's happening with Daniel, they understood that the only way they were going to catch Daniel is if they attacked his loyalty to God, if they went after his belief system. And man, how many times do we feel that, right, in our culture sometimes, right? We feel that as a people trying to live out our faith. We try to live out and represent Jesus well, right? And sometimes it feels like, you know, the one thing people have to come against us sometimes with is our, our values, you know, what we're, what we're standing for. And that can feel hard for us as the people of God, right? And so the next thing that I want you to um, remember with Daniel, we know that he had a great reputation. But the next thing that I want us to understand is that Daniel had unwavering faith. He had unwavering faith. So these leaders are jealous of Daniel. They know that the only way they can get Daniel to make a mistake is if they go after his religion, if they go after his belief in Jesus Christ. And so they go to the king. And they really stroke the king's ego. They really build the king up. And they say, oh, king, you should just, you should put this law in place for the next 30 days that no one should ever pray to anything and anyone else but you, oh, king. Okay? And the king's like, yeah, I definitely, I should definitely put that law into place, right? And so they come at the king and they use his ego against him. And so they put this law into place and they say that no one, and all the kingdom of Babylon can pray to any other god or person than King Darius. Let's check this out. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room, where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to God just as he had done before. You see, Daniel was a man of prayer. Dan was a man who sought the Lord. And he knew, right? Because Daniel was already in charge of a lot of things, right? He knew what the law was. He knew what the king had just put into place. And what he chose to do is be unwavering in his faith. He chose to continue to practice prayer, And he chose to continue practice seeking the face of the Lord. He said, I'm not going to live by what you guys are saying. I'm not going to live under this, this new law that you guys are putting in place. I'm going to continue to be faithful and be unwavering in my devotion to the Lord Jesus. And so he opens his window, right? I mean, that's pretty cool, right? He opened the window and he continued to pray. I'm reminded of a woman in history. Um, This woman in history was born in uh, the 1820s. Um, She was born into slavery, um, and she experienced the brutality and the the atrocities of slavery. Um, 29 years later, in 1849, she gets her freedom, and uh, she escapes slavery, and she goes north. And she is enjoying slavery. Or she is enjoying her freedom, sorry. She's not enjoying that. She is enjoying her freedom, right? But what she chooses to do is she chooses to be unwavering. She chooses to be unwavering. And you guys know her by the name Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman spends the next 10 years, um, the next 10 years, she made 13 trips back to the South, 13 trips back to the South, risking her life to continue freeing her people, to continue freeing um, uh, the slaves. And so we know that this is an example of someone who was unwavering, unwavering. She guided 70 enslaved people to freedom through the Underground Railroad. And you know what's really neat about Harriet Tubman is they actually nicknamed her Moses, um, if you know that story. And so despite, um, despite wanting her freedom, she was unwavering. She never gave up on the cause that she believed in. And she continued to risk her life 
She risked re-enslavement. She risked execution to continue to do what was right. And so I'm just reminded of this example of of her and of Daniel, of, of how unwavering they were. And Daniel, again, he was in this high position. Daniel knew that he was going to get caught, and yet he never, he never gave in. And man, I'm encouraging us today, as the people of God, we need to stand fast. We need to stand fast. We need to stand firm on, on who our God is and the truth of God's word. Look at Daniel chapter 6, verse 12. So these religious, these religious guys, these wisdom seekers, these diviners, so they went to the king and they spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree, king, that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or human being except to you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? So they're, they're coming back to King Darius, and they're reminding him of this law that he put into place. Look at verse 13 of Daniel 6. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, he pays no attention to you, king. He pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put into writing. He still prays three times a day. Now, the king had built a relationship with Daniel. And if you read the, the, the whole story, you see that King Darius was distressed. He was, he, at that moment, realized, oh my gosh, I allowed my ego to put this law into place, and now it's impacting this guy that I actually care about, this guy Daniel that has um, been with me, that I, I've invited into, you know, spaces of leadership. And so the king knows that he's in a really tough spot. He feels the tension now of what he has now put into place, but his love and his care for Daniel, which we'll see more in a little bit. So verse 16 says, the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel, and they threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve, continually rescue you. I underlined that because I didn't want us to miss that. This is super important. Because Daniel had a reputation, right? His faith was unwavering. He was standing firm in the Lord. And here is Darius, the king of all of Babylon. I mean, if he wasn't already, he wasn't feeling Daniel's reputation and influence, he wouldn't have said that. that. If we can go back maybe to that verse again. I just don't want us to miss this. May your God, whom you continually serve, rescue you. So there's this recognition that's beginning to happen in King Darius. Daniel chapter, Daniel chapter 6, verse 18. So the king, the king returned to his palace, and he spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him. And he could not sleep. Why? Why would a king care, care so much about this guy named Daniel, right? It's because of Daniel's reputation. It's because of Daniel's unwavering faith. Daniel and the king were close, and the king cared for Daniel. That's why he was feeling this distress to the point where he couldn't even eat. He couldn't even sleep. I mean, that's a kind of physical reaction, right, that we feel at times when something is happening with someone that we love, right, and that we care for. And you lose sleep over those those moments. We're watching them maybe go through a, a tough situation, right? So we can see the humanity in King Darius. We can begin to see the relationship between Darius and Daniel. So... The king is completely just torn up about this. And in the morning, we see something pretty amazing. The king wakes up and he rushes. I mean, he runs, right? And, and then this time, a king would never, you know, he would never run to anybody at all. He's a king. He's the man, right? Especially in the nation of Babylon. This is the world power at the time. But the king rushes back to the lion's den. Um, and he is calling out, Daniel! Daniel, are you, are you alive? Are, are you in there still? You know, he's, he's, he's concerned about his friend. Daniel! And here's what Daniel responds with in, in verse 22. My God sent his angel 
and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. That's Daniel's response. Now, we know um, if you look at some of the history, um, this lion's den, they kept these lions almost to like the level of like starvation. And without being super graphic, they did that for a reason. Okay, so that when somebody was put in the lion's den, let's just say they didn't last very long. Okay, and so they would do that intentionally to these animals. And so we know they were so super, super hungry, right? <laughs> okay, and lions were going to do what they're going to do, right? And so there is no way outside of the hand of God that these lions would not have eaten Daniel up really quickly. Okay, so look at this, because this is where I want us to, uh, this is where I want us to kind of really land today. The third thing that I want us to understand is Daniel has had influence. He has had influence over this kingdom. He has had influence over King Darius in a way that no one else was having. He had a reputation. He had unwavering faith, and he had influence, okay? Because we see in Daniel chapter 6, verses 26 through 27, this is amazing. What a turnaround you we're about to see. King Darius says, I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lion's den. I mean, that's amazing, right? That is amazing. This is a complete turnaround, right? Daniel has had a massive influence on the people that he was around. He has a massive influence. And we see this by the king changing law and saying, guys, we are going to worship. We are going to revere the God of Daniel. Okay? That, in the context of a system where they worshiped many, many gods, okay, that is a totally different change of heart, change of mind. Why? It's because of Daniel. It's because of the life that he, that he chose to live. So God has called us to be ambassadors as well, right? Like Daniel, God has called us to represent him well. Your lives, guys, your lives are a testimony of Jesus, whether we fully realize that or not. Each of your lives, each of our lives represent a story. And um, God has called us. He's charged us with this idea that, will you be my ambassador? What is your life saying about me? as your Lord and as your Savior. Sometimes, um, sometimes I know, like, you know, you can maybe hear a message like this, and maybe you're like me, and you're like, man, gosh, I feel like I have so much to work on. <laughs> you know, i got to go home and fix this in my life and change this in my life. And I don't want you to hear that today, because I think that is of the evil one. That is shame. That is guilt. Um, that is not the God that we serve. Um, I know that I've, I've heard some of these messages before. Where it's like this massive charge to really step out and, and do something amazing for God. And God does want us to be ambassadors. He does want us to represent him well. But God is also, the thing I want to caution you about, God is not calling you to be perfect. God is not calling any of us to be perfect. Um, he is calling us to be authentic. He is calling us to be ourselves in the world that we live in. Where we live, where we work, where we, where we play is kind of how we say things sometimes around here. In all those spaces where life is taking you, God is calling you to be authentic. And you know what? You know what I've learned? Sometimes in our dark times, sometimes in our weak moments, the testimony of Jesus can be even stronger than in those good times. You know, I've shared with you guys months ago about our daughter and just the things that she was walking through. She's on, she's really doing well, and we so much appreciate your prayers and support. But I'll tell you, man, I've had some of the most rich conversations through heartache, 
than I've had through, through those moments where it just feels like everything's going really well. I want to share a verse with you guys um, that kind of just, for me, just really hits home. Um, 2 Corinthians 12.9, it says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. And listen to this. For my power is made perfect in weaknesses. My power. God's power is made perfect in our weaknesses. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power, not Billy's power, not any of our power, so that Christ's power may rest on me. You know, God's grace is enough for each and every one of us. And his strength shines in our weaknesses. So the last thing that I want us to hear today is to go home and do more things and fix more things and change you know, things. God may be calling you to some of those things, but sometimes we can get caught up in this idea like, I just have to do more. I just have to do more. I just have to be better. That's not what God is asking. God is asking us to submit, surrender to him, and allow his power to be made perfect in our weaknesses. Amen? Because we have a God who is kind. We have a God who is patient. He is merciful. Um, But he has called us to be ambassadors, to be representatives of Jesus Christ. Friends, as we leave here in the next few moments, that's the thing that I want us to to go out with. Begin to ask yourself that question. Go back, continue to read, and, and Daniel, how is my life representing Jesus to the world around me? How is my life representing Jesus to the world around me? You, me, we are the light of the world. We are the light of the world. We have the Lord living in us. And so we have been called to bring Jesus' testimony to the world around us, where we work, where we're, in that, where we're at in our neighborhoods, the, the people that you're connecting with, the people that you're doing life with. You are called to be a light, a light in the darkness. Embrace that. Embrace that. And, and continue to lean on that calling. Lean into the power of God that is living in you, Okay. That's what, I wanna, that's what I want you to hear today. That's what I want you to be encouraged with. You don't have to do that in perfection, okay? You don't have to do that in perfection. God is with you. He is walking with you. He understands. He's compassionate. Uh, but he has called us to be ambassadors for him. So let's go out this week and let's be ambassadors for the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together this morning, God. I thank you for uh, just this time to worship you. It's time to open your word together, God. You have um, you've given us this charge this morning, Lord, as, as your followers to uh, represent you well. And certainly we know, God, that this can be hard at times. And um, But God, I pray that each one of us, Lord, would step out in courage, step out in faith, just remembering and recognizing what we've heard today, God, that we would follow the model of Daniel and that we would be those ambassadors in our worlds. Um, Each of us carries um, just different spheres and walks of life that we're in every week and every day. People, God, that you are putting in our places and in our paths each day. And these are people, God, that often need to hear about you. And and people that often need to know what, what Jesus is all about. And so I pray for each person here, God, that not in perfection, God, but in your strength, God, that we would live out this calling. God, we thank you for um, loving us so much, God. We thank you um, that we get to uh, partner with you in your uh, mission, in your kingdom, God. And uh, we thank you, God, for uh, just this space, God, to be together, to be in community with one another, God. Thank you for the relationships that are, that are being built here, God. And Lord, I pray that as we go into our week, Lord, God, that we would just continue to support each other and, and lean on each other, God. Thank you for uh, just your presence that has been uh, that is here with us this morning, God. We love you and we bless your name together.